All right, let's, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to queue up. I, what I did with these guys, I tried to pull up some stats and then go into some questions and some stats and questions so we can have some context around the discussion uh, and see where it takes us. So, um, all right, what's going on here? This basically is communicating what the percentage of overall budgets brand marketers have stated they're allocating towards social spend and digital spend. Let's say it's roughly 10% on the social side. And then of the social side, 11% of that is going into influencers. So you're looking at basically 1% of the budget into influencers. However, yet all of you are here today to learn about influencers in the most significant way it's impacting your overall campaign. So is it one of those scenarios where you're spending 20% of your time and 80% of your business? What is the focus? There's something going on here you guys are on the cutting edge, pioneering new age creativity influencers. I think this is a very smart investment of all our time in going there. A final point is on the left-hand side, talks a little bit about channel partner rankings. Uh, sitting right next to me, Jonah, in full screen, is a significant uh, shareholder in the space in terms of unique video views per month. Anybody know what the average monthly unique views on any of the big networks are? Anybody? Believe it or not, uh, CBS last month reported roughly close to 35 million unique viewers. So when I talk about TV and I talk about unique viewership, when we talk about influencer side, I thought that was kind of, there, there's something interesting in terms of trying to correlate the value, viewership, engagement, sharing, commenting. TV gets brought up a lot, but as well at the same time, sometimes gets lost in the overall conversation. Okay, so let's get into our first discussion, guys, and uh, have a little, little uh, uh, <coughs> kind of dialogue taking place. So enlisting influencers, connecting to their audiences, and creating new content. Um, I'm a marker in the room that is planning in the planning phase. These people are thinking about using influencers in their marketing mix. How do you even classify influencers in your marketing mix? Where does the budget come from? Typically, when you add in one area, you have to take away from another. So. What's going on? You're, the, the, you're sitting down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with, I want to start with Jonah. Jonah, because you're, you're getting a lot of phone calls from agencies and brands and probably stating, hey, can you get a proposal for us? Let me see where it's at. And then they're coming back and saying, all right, well, how, what's kind of measurement? What kind of role? What kind of funding? You know, how do you talk to brands and agencies and partners, media partners to say, this is why this is, is making sense beyond it just being the hottest thing right now? What, what do you, how do you handle that dialogue? Sure, I mean the interesting uh, you know, part of the equation is as you noted, uh, there's not one central location. When you look at um, the TV industry, it's, it's a very clear line between the buying and the selling um, sides of the business. And with influencer marketing, um, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle that have that in their portfolio. So you know, we will work with media agencies, creative agencies, social media agencies, PR agencies, uh, different teams at the brand level that also want to get involved in influencer marketing. And so I guess the answer for us is really just we have to talk to everybody and connect the dots between um, you know, the opportunities. And um, budgets are really coming from all those different areas. So it really depends on each client and how they're planning and who's coming to the table. In a lot of cases, you have different agencies. You might have a PR agency and a creative agency agency coming to the table with an influencer marketing concept. And it's really once you've locked in on what that strategy is and who the partner is going to be, um, then it's like, okay, well, how do we pay for it? You had an interesting analogy when we were talking about the correlation between kind of subscription cable and, and influencer channel. Can you talk about that real quick too? Sure. I mean, so a lot of, a lot of um, you know, a lot of the market is really getting excited about influencer marketing today in 2014. And they're saying, okay, who are these channels? Because we've never heard of them, but we see that they have a million, three million, five million subscribers on YouTube, you know, four million followers on, on Vine. This is amazing, the amount of audience, but we haven't heard of them. Can you help us uh, describe their influence, their power, who is watching them, who is subscribing? And um, typically what we'll do is we'll kind of paint a picture around the next generation. We call it the connected generation around um, folks that have really leaned into the digital media landscape and are seeking that out uh, as their first means of entertainment. So, um, you know, they're looking at some of the larger channels on YouTube and Vine and social media as really their primary source of entertainment. Um, and they're, 
they're looking at these channels like the next version of cable TV, right? If you're 15 or 16, uh, you might not be going to Comedy Central, you might be going to Shane Dawson's channel um, and really going there first to check out what the new, you know, what videos that Shane is publishing um, or Devin's Super Tramp or, you know, any of these other amazing influencers that are creating content and just putting up huge numbers of viewership. And so um, we see the social video landscape and the influencer marketing landscape as the next evolution of the TV business. Interesting. Laura, um, you're doing uh, I, I, a lot of incredible work with influencers within Sony's ecosystem and the planning, uh, not only talking about effectiveness, talking about efficiencies, but from the top level right now, as you're coaching your team, looking at your planning and influencers in the overall mix, can you share a little bit about some of that thinking that, that it go into that process for you? Yeah, I mean, we've been working with influencers at Sony Online Entertainment for well over two years. So it's something where it was a little bit of the Wild West and we weren't quite sure how to categorize it. And I think we've learned a lot in the last few years, mostly in part to the hardworking folks on my team. But, you know, we reorged our department. So brand, PR and community are connected at the hip and they don't operate without one another. And I think that's helped a lot for us to wrap our head around it so we don't have to classify it in a particular category or bucket. And I think the other thing we recognized is that influencers, and this has been talked about a lot today, run the, ga the gamut, right? So you've got the influencers who are just getting started who want the attention from a Sony Online Entertainment. So we re-architected all of our websites to be able to profile them and highlight them and give them the notoriety they're looking for and help them grow along with us. And then you've got the influencers on the other end of the spectrum that have already made it. And you know, how do you think about those differently? And you know, we're constantly trying to build relationships with them. So when we think about buying media, you know, there's the discovery piece and there's the performance piece. And influencers are the one piece that span the whole funnel. And I think that's really interesting um, because we don't have to sort of pinpoint them into a particular bucket. They can accomplish many, many different KPIs. Scott, you're, uh, I think, riffing off of Laura. You're, you're in an interesting position where at AG, where you, as the vice president of social and digital, you're dealing with brands. You're dealing with an incredible content opportunity, right? Sports, entertainment, music. And there's an influence element to these promotional programs that probably weren't brought into the consideration set five or six years ago because of technology, because of a role like yours. Um, how are how are you in your planning phase and dealing with looking at partners and brands? Isn't is influence the the critical component to that? That's um, that's a really good question. I think um, and thanks for setting it up like that. You know, we we certainly are uniquely positioned because we arguably reach the most passion based lifestyle interests, sports and music, and. We like to position it saying we reach those influencers. They are intrinsic to music and sports, and they also are the ones who are most likely to be setting the opinions and setting the tone and the pace among their peers. So we kind of position as you have your influencers. How can you connect with them? How can we create more interactive experiences so you can touch them more directly? You know, one of the beauties of social and digital is that it becomes that much more emotional. So how do we get that connective tissue tailored to those social uh, pieces that amplifies their, their programming. Before it was just activating on marks, right? You had, you had your, your inventory, you had your campaigns, you had your LEDs or you had your signage and uh, you, know, you were done. Now it's how do we develop deeper, in, you know, deeper connections? How do we get the data on the back end? How do we get our influencers to share that message about their, the best experience they've ever had and allow the partners to play the hero of that experience. One, they play the hero, it makes them look that much cooler. Two, it also provides an opportunity to kind of connect through a side door. And three is the data capture and the remarketing opportunities and allows those brands to tell those stories. And if those stories are compelling enough, and I think that's where the secret sauce is, is that we have to create a very unique custom approach, whether it's for the Kings and McDonald's or it's Herbalife and the Galaxy, or it's Heineken and Coachella, how do we develop those stories that really connects with the influencers who you know are already there and then want to share that, uh, that piece of information, whether it's through it's Twitter, whether it's through Facebook, or whether it's through Instagram, and capturing that moment and then making sure it, it, they mobilize their social graphs. So, so it, you're able to, and I know when we talked earlier, you gave Delta and Kings as an example as well. Yeah. And your client in this case is Delta. 
and they're asking to integrate their brand experience with the Kings, another great brand, yeah. and using influencers to activate that brand experience in that unique siloed moment. I mean, how do you, what, how, what's the influencer, what's the influence you're identifying in this situation that rings true for, for Delta to say this is tapping into an audience I wasn't able to tap into before? Well, I, you know, I think we have a different point of view in terms of how we, how we define influencer and how we, how we develop these programs. You know, we, we do a lot of listening, and I think that's critical to any, any business operation is really trawling and, and following and, and, and listening to seeing what the, what's, what's bubbling, what's percolating, what is really capturing their attention. And then based on those sort of, you know, empirical and, and qualitative sort of pieces that we draw out, then developing a social campaign for, for the partner. For example, with Delta you were talking about, we did a super fan campaign. Arguably, they all feel that our, you know, the people that are following, whether through traditional channels or through, uh, t through Twitter or Facebook and following the Kings, they already feel that they have a pretty, a pretty big voice and a pretty powerful voice. We try to assess and analyze which of those are the, influ the, the, the real influencers. And then targeting them through a campaign and, and finding something that we think they, th or they think is cool that we can then capture. So, you know, the whole Jeff Bezos model of, you know, start with the consumer and work backwards, that's what we tried to do with the Kings, where we, have a, we had a super fan campaign for Delta, which I think is what you're kind of alluding to. And every, if, if you follow hockey, you know, everyone's, I mean, they're, they're bananas about the sport. And every team, whether you're the Rangers or the Dallas Stars or the Kings, think that they have the best fans. So how do we create a, mo a social campaign or an interactive campaign that really captures the essence of this fandom? And that's essentially what we did. Delta was trying to promote, wanted to promote their business elite service, first time going from New York to LA. It's a really phenomenal business class elite service. The Rangers were playing the Kings uh, opening nights at, at Staples. So we empowered, engaged the, uh, our, our, Twitter social, our Twitter and Facebook fans uh, with the Kings and said, submit your story for why you think you should be the King super fan. And if you, we'll, have a, we'll have a kind of like a NC tournament bracket pool. We'll look at your photos. You'll provide us your Twitter handles. You'll provide us your, your Instagram handles. And we'll let the fans decide. So they actually had to empower their followers to then support them to win this ultimate getaway, which was you know eight weeks later, the, the bookend game with the Kings and the Rangers at Madison Square Garden. They flew business, business elite cla first class. They uh, stayed two nights in the city, and then they had a great seats of the game, and it would all be captured via um, their social handles. We rounded out to the eight most influential guys who seemed to really kind of represent and embody the, the, the fandom of the Kings, and we had a, uh, a bracket pool. That one winner then had that ultimate sort of VIP experience, and we, we generated a huge following, and they, they kind of galvanized their fans and followers to support the program. Cool. So for both you and Laura, if I'm hearing you clearly, Laura, who has, Sony has an incredible connected community and product, H1Z1s, PlanetSide 2s, EverQuest franchise, DC franchise, you have Kings, you have Galaxy. It sounds like in the planning, you almost already have a pre-built stable of influencers. Your culture is nurturing in-house your own team to start as a tip of the sword. Is that right? Um, at least for us it is, you know, I think that we have the luxury of working in an entertainment category, so we have very passionate players, and we're a publisher that believes that the more we partner with them, the more it's going to be mutually beneficial. Um, we even have programs where they're sharing in the revenue stream by making virtual items that we're putting in our games. So there's a lot of interesting ways for all of those things to intersect, and I think it's about cultivating that relationship from indifference all the way up to loyalty and intimacy. And so, you know, we're polling our players and sending out like Landmark. We just launched these surveys where we took, based on the number of sessions you had had in our game, we sent you a different survey. Well, the one that the people who had logged in over 50 times was materially different than the one that the people had logged in two times. And it was all about how more connected can you be to us? Do you want to be a brand advocate? Are you making videos? We'll help you. And in some cases, we're actually, instead of paying for content, because they're the ones making it, we're now in the position of only having to amplify it with media. And so our dollars are going towards that direction and that makes them feel great. It's helping build their brand and their persona and they have this level of notoriety and you know, feel better about us as a publisher and what we're doing to support them. So uh, Jonah then, 
here's two brands. We're managing significant portfolios. They have a stable and team in-house. Jeanette from Estee Lauder ta talked earlier today around doing programs that are not in silos, but over the entire year. Do you get calls that say, hey, can you set up a, a brand partnership annually with X suite of influencers based on these identifiers? Or is it still just brands that are still thinking of as little mini campaigns? Absolutely, it's it's really uh, it's been a hot topic for 2014. Um, you know, we've been we've been talking about this for the last three years in, in terms of let's get out of the campaign um, life cycle. When you're when you're a brand, you're a, you're an influencer. When you're an influencer, you're a brand. It's really a two way street, and um, and you know the influencers have fans that are 24 seven, 365, and if they're going to work with a brand and do something really cool, um, you know, for example. Um, Last summer, we did a big program with Ford and Devin Supertramp, and they created a summer program called One Tank Adventure, and it was really about what crazy adventures, Dev, for those of you guys that don't know, Devin is a action sports and stunt uh, videographer and a, a fantastic director, and his, his video quality uh, is amazing. And so Ford said, what crazy stunts can he do in different Ford vehicles in different areas of the US on one tank of gas? So how far could he go, and what crazy things could he do? And, um, and the, the fans obviously fell in love with it. You know, the series did 10 million organic views. But the, the question is, um, what's next, right? Um, how do we continue on with that adventure between Devin and Ford and the connection that they built between all those fans? And so um, it's something that, you know, we're talking to all of our clients about. It's like, uh, we, we want to do campaigns because you know it's important. We have to drive sales against a particular quarter. But we also want to uh, really replicate in the video landscape what uh, brands have done so successfully across social media and Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You would never just do one one tweet and walk away, right? Uh, you have to really you have to tweet all the time, every day. You have to engage. You have to publish. And so, video content and influencer marketing is very similar. You have to really uh, think about it on a year landscape, and um, it's it's a question that's coming up a lot. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting how um, we're going out of our way to really engage influencers to reach our audiences and. Last time I checked, it takes more than once to just kind of build a relationship. It goes a long time. So just to kind of get it up and say, all right, goodbye, I'll come back again later, that's, that actually is kind of anti-relationship building. So it, it, it's interesting because it's coming to my mind as we're, we're talking here. So let's move into a, another topic, which I heard a lot, uh, PewDiePie's and larger scale is better. We've heard no, go just small. And you know, on a chart on the left here, you'd think the bigger, the better. And about 50%, it's about 50-50 where, you know what, it's actually small, medium, and large. And it's just not the biggest that went out, but there's definitely a mix um, in there. 65% of brands are actually raised their hands and said we're doing influencer marketing. Um, and, it, and there's a lot of different vehicles by which they do promote against and are active and engaged down. So brands and agencies constantly question or challenge the EMV value of social interaction. So it's a little bit of a metrics questions, guys. And it's been on stage here about how do you measure and value? We've talked about engagement. So what should we, I'm gonna go a different direction. What should we not question? What should we not question in the relationship of ROI? Instead of what should we be looking for in ROI? Let's go the other way. What should we not question? What is it that's actually, because for Laura and for Scott, it's a slam dunk. Like, of course we're gonna be doing this because these are the reasons why. What, what are some of the just for sure things that we know are guaranteed or things that I feel confident when I go into in deploying influencers in my campaign strategy that I feel very confident as a marketing executive that this is going to work for us? You guys want, want, want to go first? So. I mean, we, I can share a couple of stats in terms of our success stories, but um, you know, right. early on in the life cycle of Planet Side 2 when the product was in beta, uh, there's a guy, Total Biscuit, who is known as the cynical Brit, and that's his persona, and he's actually a really funny guy. Um, he made one video for Planet Side 2, and the very next day we had three times the beta registrations. And we weren't able to achieve that through display media for like $5 CPA. So it was incredible to see the power he had, and it was just the perfect person and the perfect influencer because he had played Planet Side 1, and it very much resonated with his community. Um, with H1Z1, our new product, we're taking a fan-first approach. So everybody's in the front row, whether you're a member of the media, you're an influencer, you're a player, doesn't matter. So we invited every day some influencers down for the last two weeks, and we would look at our website metrics. So 
in real time how many more people are coming to the website within 10 minutes of this, his stream going up on Twitch TV. Within an hour, how many more email opt-ins did we get? And the answer to that was anywhere from 10 to 20% day over day lift. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples. Adam just shared one with me on the train up for the Yogg's cast. They're huge into the Minecraft community, and our new game is very much in sort of that sphere. And uh, when we looked on a monthly basis, what we had spent in paid search was the equivalent of what we had spent on influencers. And, uh, or I, I guess it was paid search was about half of what we had spent. Sorry, I'm getting that wrong. Other way around. We had spent half as much with the influencers, and their results were double paid search, which is normally our highest performing. Did the, did the paid search lift go up a little bit with influencers versus on or off? Because I'm sure you're imagining them integrated, correct? So with influence versus not? I mean, there's some attribution probably correlated. Yeah. So for those that couldn't hear that, it was not only beta registration, so generating leads and more qualified leads, it was actually selling our founders packs, so in the e-commerce vertical too. Um, so we're actually conversion and attributing measurable ROI to the campaign. And it consistently works time and time again. It has to be the right influencer. That's interesting because that ecosystem, I, I actually take a positive of that because some people are like, well, it's, it's a client that's digitally connected and the whole commerce stream is heavily managed. but someone who's actually heavily managed the entire funnel and has actually saw attribution with influencers without and all things being equal, it's a great validation for other uh, brands and influencers that are taking place there. Scott, what about, uh, what about you? Any thoughts there? Thank you, Laura. Um, you know, you go ma I can go in many different directions. In other than free tickets to games, man. Yeah, well, you guys. That's, that's a great incentive. Uh, <laughs> Especially, you know, with the Kings now winning the cup. Uh, five years ago, it's a different story. But, you know, I think one of the things that's really interesting and one of the values of social is that, is that statistic that Nielsen kind of re reported on. And, uh, it seems like they report the same statistic every year, but it's 91% of respondents said that they trust advertising if, it, if it's recommended by someone they know or a friend. And I, that is intrinsic to what social is all about. So if you can do the organic sort of you know, sharing and making sure that content is shared around that experience from people you know, well, then that's really a, a, a pretty impactful ROI and why you see conversion rates when it comes from a social sort of exchange so much higher than your typical tra traditional media sort of messaging. You know, music and sports, invariably you're talking about the millennial group and they're incredibly elusive to target and we, that's, that's our core audience and demographic. Also, mobile is critical to what we do. And we want to make sure that they're, they're with, they're, we keep them in that ecosystem. So not only are they you know, having that best you know, once in a lifetime experience, they're at a Stone show, or they're you know, um, listening to Taylor Swift, or they're at a festival, or the Kings, they're capturing that moment. And then if we can provide them additional touch points that engages them, that you're not just seeing you know, a 120 by 50 banner unit on the phone, but actually providing something that amplifies that experience, then that they want to share that then it makes, them, it makes that experience even cooler. And we, we also recognize that there has to be something for them, a quid pro quo beyond that cool experience, that cool extension, whether it's mobile or social, what other rewards can we provide? So that's also kind of key in terms of what we're building out, that there's an immediate sort of surprise and delight and association with the campaigns that we're developing. But I would say it's transformative in terms of what we're trying to do in live entertainment versus five years ago. You know, digital allows brands to get closer to the fans and the fans close to the brands, and if we can do that in a really kind of cool and elegant way, then you're generating a lot of, you're generating that ROI that, that partners are asking for. And one other thing regarding ROI is that it's important that you don't, because there isn't real, there isn't a standard sort of currency with ROI with digital and social in many, most instances. So it's important to understand what the objectives and the goals are and the mission is and the purpose of the brand before you start executing that program so you're not caught off guard and you're not caught into this kind of weird place where you suddenly feel forced to guarantee something that you're unsure of is actually going to generate the sort of maximum sort of awareness and key metrics on the back end. So you need to be mindful of that as well. John, anything you want to add to that? One thing, um, it's a, first of all, it's a pretty good question. Um, so congrats on that. I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I'm taking my time for the last 10 it minutes. It took me a to couple minutes out. to figure it out. Yeah, <laughs> that's a pretty good question. Uh, Time's up. I mean, 
I think uh, subscriber base is one of the things that should not be counted when it comes to ROI. I mean, the, the first gut reaction uh, when you're looking to do an influencer marketing campaign is how big of a subscriber number can I, you know, can I get with my budget, right? I want the maximum amount of subscribers for my influencer. And I think um, that that's something that, it's, um, that should be looked beyond just the subscriber number. So just to give you guys an example, Scott DW, is one of our favorite influencers. We have, by the way, 46,000 influencers in the full screen network. Um, he's a guy who's immensely talented. He has 200,000 subscribers, and he has some, uh, some viral hits that have gotten him up to 30 million views. And when you think about 200,000 subscribers, you're like, okay, that's awesome, but it's not 3 million, 5 million, 10 million subscribers where you just kind of expect those types of viewership numbers and just influence on the, the internet. So super talented guy, really influential in the YouTube community. Um, and it's not really just about a subscriber number. One other example is uh, Fresh Big Mouth. He is a very influential guy in social media because he's collaborated with hundreds and hundreds of influencers. He's a musician, and he's, uh, he's featured on music tracks across really popular viral hits, but he just started his own YouTube channel. He has 10,000 subscribers, but we are pitching and p passionately pitching this guy um, you know, across the country because we think he's so amazing. And the first thing we say is ignore the 10,000 subscribers. This is one of the coolest, most popular influencers that is out there. And you know, he has audience. We'll, we'll find the metrics to show you the ROI. Drop an Oscar. What's a little treat, Siona, for the new young talent for people to look into? Um, all right, fantastic. So uh, this was actually something that was talked about as well at, at, at several panels. This is really hard to read. But um, it talked about brand requests. So on the, on the right-hand side, 70% of influencers get 10 or less requests uh, per week for brand engagement, and obviously moves up from there. Uh, on the left-hand side, that lower left-hand chart, uh, talks about why, why would I want to be working with brands? What's the reason, right? Is it access to information? Is there an event? Is there some campaign activity? About three or four down there is being paid. It's actually not number one. Um, on the right hand of that chart says, where do I find it? 35%, I think it's 35 or 37% is agencies. Uh, then Facebook, I think there's some comments earlier that said, how do, you, how do people discover you when we had the creator visionaries up there? And people are like, they just email me. So um, there still is a need to facilitate and manage the relationships, right? And get these guys uh, interacted. I mean, you mentioned you're managing, would you say 46,000? 46, and I think Vinny threw up a slide that said there's a, a million influencers, so that's... 0.05% or whatever it is. Um, so fantastic. So knowing influencers are looking for exclusives, early access, product. Where does it fit in the campaign strategy? Am I giving everything up to the influencers and the PR agencies? You can have it day and date and a little later. How, how, is this, how does this work now with giving up the, if they're saying, your brand is on my channel, but listen, I want something powerful to talk to my audience about. I just don't want to just be a second wheel. How are we handling this now, or, or, or are we okay with this? This is, this is actually, it's consumer first anyhow. I mean, Laura, could you maybe dive in first on this one? Sure, I touched on it a little bit earlier with H1Z1 and our new product strategy with this release that's coming up, and we wanted to see what we could do organically. What if we didn't spend any money? And we were able to tap into not only the PR channel, but also the influencer channel, cultivate these very deep relationships early on so that they were getting early access and exclusives. What would that net? And we've seen phenomenal results thus far. And it's not to say that we aren't going to amplify it with media or find other pivot points along the way. But where we are right now, we're not even beta yet. Um, it's worked phenomenally well. And we're letting people in behind the curtain. And we haven't given people any sort of like distinguishing, you have X number of followers, you fit in this category. Are you somebody who has a voice with our competitor? With the games that fit within this sphere? Are you somebody who somebody, you know, the consumers view as credible? And if that's the case and you check all of those boxes, then yes, we want you to come down. We'll fly you down to our studio, give you a tour, let you stream the game exclusively. And we've seen, you know, tens of thousands of people concurrently watching these streams, and then the VODs go crazy thereafter, um, you know, and it's worked. And the, some of the ROI stats I'd given earlier, we're definitely seeing it happen. But it's challenging, because you want to make sure you're taking care of the press and all the different constituents. That So, you know, distribution today, and I think that's really been a theme, is just as important as the content. So we think long and hard about the distribution strategy 
as well as the content that we're creating. So it's not that you necessarily uh, go out of your way to give influencers first, but at the same time, you understand that you're, you're comfortable with them day in, day being part of the journey along with the press, along with the community, along with uh, other partners involved. And you know, let all, all rise to the top. Let it all take place in this kind of canon of opportunity because discoverability and share a voice and it's hard to have one really drive it all, especially when you're trying to be efficient with your dollars. There's just not enough money out there. I mean, Scott, is there anything from your standpoint that uh, you know, dabbles around the notion of uh, exclusivity other than access to locker rooms or something? Well, <laughs> which, I'll, which I'll do. You know, it's all those things. Uh, I completely agree with Laura. I could almost end, you know, put down the, drop the mic at that point. Um, but how many of you, have, how many in the audience have a Samsung phone or a Galaxy? And are you guys familiar with the program that we're doing right now with, uh, with AEG venues, including Staples Center? Well, we, we launched this program with Samsung. It's, in, it's running across 41 venues that AEG owns and operates. And anybody who has a Samsung phone, a Galaxy phone, brings it into, downloads the owner's hub, which is the reward sort of program app for, uh, powered by Samsung with their NFC technology. If you bring it into Staples Center, for example, you press it against one of those tech tiles, you immediately receive a prize. And that, pro that reward is anything from um, skipping the line to a $5 food credit to even much better rewards, in fact, getting up to the suite. So capturing that moment when someone, everybody wins, you get to your, you know, you're going to Lady Gaga last week, you have your Galaxy phone, and you immediately are upgraded. We have a brand ambassador to come down and escort you up to, you know, a uh, high level or, or, or a suite. Well, that's a, you just took an amazing experience and made it that much better. And obviously, Samsung playing the hero and the fans sharing that across their, their networks really mobilizes their social graph because they want to share this unbelievable experience. So I think at the end of the day, what we're trying to do on brands is create these amazing experiences and make them that much better. Yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is an interesting topic because I think over the last three or four years, we've seen a wave of, uh, of brands calling influencers to essentially promote a product, right? Buy my perfume, check out this handbag, I'm launching a new phone. And um, I think now we're, we're sort of seeing a 2.0 version of that, which is, Let's make sure the influencer is actually protecting their editorial voice. Um, this is something that you know that we're we're talking a lot about. You know, we don't want someone just pushing to buy a product. We want them to really talk about the space and and really protect an editorial voice um, so that they have credibility and they don't lose that credibility. Because, like Laura was saying, if you're pushing Xbox today and Sony tomorrow, it's like, well, who are you who? Why should I even listen to you? And so, um, as these campaigns are coming up and these objectives are coming up, we're saying, okay, let's not just push the product, let's talk about that topic at hand and maybe we mention it in the review, but we need to respect the editorial voice of the influencer. Um, and we can be really creative in ways that we do that. Um, you know, we can give somebody access to, um, you know, uh, the behind the scenes of the making of or sitting down and interviewing the publisher without just saying, go buy it. Cool. And I think uh, some of the the YouTube and, and content creators that have been here earlier, they've really been raising their hand and saying, we want a seat at the table. We're, re we're, we're mature enough, professional enough uh, in certain situations where if we could sit on the table at the same time with the media partners and the event partners and uh, the brand and agency that uh, we can contribute ideas. We, we have a value to bring along and uh, I'm actually quite surprised at that level of sophistication. Um, and it's not that as an agency, I'm like, no, I got to hold you back. I don't want to say the wrong thing. It's more like, hmm, how are we, you know, how is this managed in all the, you know, the media mix? But uh, that's refreshing, actually. Interesting. All right. So some questions have been asked earlier about how much things cost. Um, this is not a, uh, this is a piece of research Eisenberg does in terms of buying. This isn't telling, this isn't anybody's rates, but these are generalities, right, in terms of just, ranges by which certain uh, influencers based on subscriber levels and certainly everything's open subjected to debate. I actually don't want to debate cost here right now what people are paying nor do I want to ask you what you're paying. But the fact of the matter is 64 54% of our making revenue and the fact of the matter is, is that uh, they are making revenue either it's from just their own channels through YouTube paying them or through actual brand marketers paying them engagement on program. So much is being said about brands paying influencers to endorse a product or service. Is this wrong? 
Is it a form of journalism or press or endorsement? Uh, what is, what's, anyone want to, anyone have an opinion here on the POV on this one, uh, what's taking place? I mean, I think it's all about the content. It's about entertainment. You know, in some cases, somebody might be a journalist or they might be uh, taking a reporting point of view. But for us, it's really about uh, making about the content experience uh, so that as a consumer, as a user, if you show up to someone's page and you subscribe, you're actually excited about what, they're, uh, that what they've been empowered to do by a particular brand partner. Um, and I think, you know, just calling out the, the Ford example again, it was like we went to Ford, we, Ford went to Devin in full screen and said, what did Devin always want to do that hasn't got, he hasn't gotten around to doing or potentially hasn't had the opportunity to produce something as wild as these ideas? Give us those thoughts and how can we empower that journey and take his fans on that journey? And I think the fans get excited because it's still within his voice. Um, and he's not necessarily telling people, go buy this. It's, uh, I'm going on a journey that's been enhanced by Ford and come along with me. Anybody else? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I don't think there's anything, certainly I don't think there's anything wrong. It's, I just think it's a modern form of, of endorsement. You look at a LeBron James or you look at a Kobe Bryant or Ronaldo or, or um, Rihanna. I don't, I don't see the difference between finding, finding a, uh, a social media influencer that has that same amount of clout that would support that, that brand. I think the most important thing is regardless if it's traditional or it's social influencer, it's making sure that there's context there. And you know, my company a while ago, and it, it, it still gives me chills, is when I saw, you know, Fergie was on a show doing cartwheels on top of a pickup. You know, that's not the right branding that you really want. I don't know who buys into that. It actually has a, a diminishing value return because it feels forced and, you know, we always say millennials can sniff out, you know, phoniness. Well, I think anyone can sniff out phoniness if it doesn't seem contextual to the, the product that they're endorsing. So, you know, to what Jonah is saying is, finding that social influencer, and I think the idea is that it's so custom, that they're so deeply ingrained in terms of that experience, and that's why they're sh sharing it. You know, there's a great quote, and it says that one billion social media users are history's largest and greatest un unpaid workforce. And the idea is that you have these evangelists and you have these apostles who want to work for you. And as long as it's contextual, as long as it seems legit and organic, then it's certainly not wrong. I think it's only wrong in terms of your choice of celebrity supporting your product that could have actually a negative impact on people's kind of perceptions of your brand or and also less inclination to want to buy. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And just to add two other points, they're entertainers. They're not journalists. And secondarily, they're very upfront about what, what the relationship is. It's very apparent when you're reading the content, what's around the content. And so I think that as long as you're upfront about it, you're not trying to obfuscate it, you're fine. And, you know, I, I, just like you were saying, the consumer can sniff it out immediately, so you would never even want to engage in content like that. Excellent. Problem solved on that. So thank you guys for your time. Uh, we uh, will take one, one, Jay says no, but anyone have a question? This is your chance if you want to talk about anything around media and planning and budgeting. Yes, gentleman in the red. I mean, I, th I think the quick answer is, um, I think, you know, what Laura was saying is um, they want to, I think fans want to just see the acknowledgement that this is a partnership and that is, if it's, if as long as it's honest and authentic, then I don't think they'll be annoyed. Um, yeah, we haven't, we, in the last couple of years, we've gone all in, full acknowledgement. Here's what's taking place, hasn't been an issue at all. And I think there's several creators in the room and they've already mentioned that they're right up front, just let them know and their fans are, are good to go. Thank you guys for your time and making your time up here. Thank you guys for uh, sticking around. Let's get to our next panel. Jonah, Scott, Laura, thank you guys.